Hello? 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 No. Hello? Ryan. Ryan, I know you can hear me. Ryan, uh, Ryan I know you can hear me. Come on up because these mics aren't working. Testing. Hello. Uh, you're going to be first off, so let me, let me get you set up first. Hey, Joe, you're going Good evening, everybody. Hope you, hope you had a nice weekend. Hope you had a happy election. I know all of us at this table did. And um, welcome. So this is the November 13th meeting of the Development and Government, Government Relations Subcommittee to the Holyoke City Council. I'm the chairman. With me is Councilor from Ward 2, Nelson Roman, and the two at-large council, two of the at-large councilors, uh, Joseph McGivern to my far left and Michael Sullivan to my media left. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have meeting minutes, so I'm going to ask for a motion for number two, if I could. Motion to take up item number two. Second. On the motion, take up number two. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, before us is a is in order the City Council invite the new PBTA Administrator, Sandra Sheehan, to a future meeting to discuss bus and transit service in and around Holyoke. And then I go into a little bit about Ms. Sheehan's background, but I'm gonna let you handle it yourself. So uh, Ms. Sheehan, welcome. Very happy to have you here. Thank you for taking some time out. Um, so so w when we kind of change the format of this committee, this is you know, what we envisioned is that we would have uh, people just like yourself um, and elected officials, uh, other professionals, stakeholders, if you will, um, that have an interest in, in, in Holyoke, Holyoke City government or, or, or any of the above. So we've had, you know, the state rep from Sal Hadley, the state senator, the state rep. We've had the um, superintendent of the soldiers home. We've had the superintendent of Mass DOT District 2. Um, it's been, you know, a really, a really nice stretch over the last four years. And so this is the first time we've had the, the PBTA administrator come in. And, but I, you can rest assured the PBTA has been a topic of conversation here uh, uh, every second Tuesday since I've been here. So not everyone, but quite often. Um, and not always, um, you know, in a mean way, just, just we, <laughs> okay, so I just want to say that. So make sure that mic's a, you know, a little bit closer to you. Yeah, just a touch closer, thank you. Um, what I'd like you to do, if you would, is maybe just uh, introduce yourself, uh, a little bit about your background, and if you want to say anything about PVT and Holyoke, um, 
where you see it's going, and then and then um, uh, we'll uh, you know take your time, hover you know wherever you, you know, however long you want. Just just don't be more than like ten minutes, and then uh, and then um, then then we'll 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 just have a give and take for a little bit, and we'll go from there. Okay, I prepare a presentation, so uh, I'm not sure if you guys want to go through that, but however you want to do it is what we want to do. Thank you. Uh, good evening to all of you, and it's an honor to. And an honor and a pleasure to be here. I'm glad to see that you guys are discussing PVTA every other Tuesday or every Tuesday. <laughs> um, I hope it's all good. If it's not, that's why I'm here, to make sure that you guys let us know what we're not doing correctly and what we need to improve on, because that's the whole point of the transportation services that we provide for the city and the region at large. Um, my name is Sandra Sheehan. I am the new administrator of PVTA. I came to um, take over the position on June 1st of this year. And I do have 25 years of transit experience. I started as a transportation planner at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And I moved on to PVTA. I was the assistant administrator and I was there for 13 years. And I did everything from planning, operations, um, operations oversight, grant management, procurement, you name it. Um, I have possibly have done it all as it pertains to transportation planning and operations. I left PVTA and went into um, Greater Hartford Transit District. I was a director of uh, grants and contract administration. I did a lot of project management, uh, carried over uh, projects for the city of Hartford, the city of New Britain, uh, the city of, uh, I mean, the town of Mansfield and the town of Enfield. So we did a lot of transit projects um, and uh, did a lot of procurement as well as transit management and oversight of grant and uh, capital projects. Then I'm back at PVTA, and like I said, I'm back home. I never left the town of Hamden. That's where we, my family lives. And so I'm here to talk about PVTA, not about myself. I wanted to give you some overview of the PVTA. PVTA is one of the largest, uh, it's actually the largest regional transit authority in Massachusetts. We are, um, outside of the MBTA, we're the largest. We are twice the size of Worcester. Uh, we have a budget that's twice the size of theirs, and we have as the ridership or ridership's a lot higher than they are. The other uh, RTAs provide service throughout Massachusetts, but we are by, by far the largest. We cover 24 communities. We have a population of 550,000 people, and it's an area that's 600 square miles, and it goes from an urban center, suburban, and rural communities. Uh, we have 188 fixed route buses and 141 paratransit vehicles. We have over 40 routes that provide service to the valley, the Pioneer Valley. Um, and we provide what's called complementary paratransit service. So that means that people, because of their disability that are unable to go to a bus stop, PVTAs provide them complementary service in a smaller vehicle. We also provide dial a ride or senior service transportation for the elderly in our communities. Uh, last year that ended on June 30th, PVTA had an almost 12 million passenger ridership. And for this year that we're in, fiscal year 18, we have a budget of almost $49 million. Our ridership, like I mentioned, is almost 12 million passenger, and that includes 11.5 uh, uh, fixed route passengers. Those are the passengers on the bigger buses, and around 244,000 in paratransit. I do want to make a point that ridership has been going down, and that's a national trend at 6% for the PVTA. And I wanted to give you some general information about the type of uh, passengers that ride our system. We do have what is considered a transit-dependent population that for w whatever reason, a variety of reasons, they do not have any other way to make their transportations uh, or their trip. And 52% uh, of those people survey indicated that they do not own a car. So we're a little bit different than the bigger systems because we do have a very large a portion of transit dependent population. But 25% of our trips are for people going to work, and it's not your standard shift of eight to five, or eight to four, nine to five. It's more of a um, part-time jobs at retail facilities where you work in the morning or you work in the afternoon or you have a longer shift or you cover the middle of the day. So our ridership during the day has like a more or less like a curve the majority of the passengers are being transported like in the middle of the day. We do have some commuters, and those are the ones that use most of the express service. Uh, we, the people that use our system to go to work uh, generate approximately $7 million in wages. 
And 25% of the trips are also for education. We provide service for the five college system, for HCC, Westfield State University, STCC. We have contracts and agreements with them where we provide them passes for their students and they're able to ride the, uh, the bus system. Um, I think I included just about all the universities. And we also have trips that are made for medical appointments. And just for the city of Holyoke alone, we have what we um, consider the three, the four types of um, service. The tier, there's a tier one and a tier two, which are the routes that carry the most passengers, and they're in the urban centers. Uh, the city of Holyoke has what we call the purple 20, the purple 21, the blue 48, and the X90. And those routes provide service from Springfield to Holyoke, or to the Holyoke uh, Mall via the Riverdale Shops or via Chicopee. Uh, the B48 provides service from Northampton to Veterans Park. The X90 connects the system from East La Meadow through Springfield, Chicopee, and the flats in Holyoke. Uh, we also have express service. The P11 provides service to Holyoke Community College, and that's from downtown Springfield. Uh, as I mentioned before, the students are given passes, and they ride any route in the system going to um, Union Station, and then from Union Station, they take an express service to the college. We also have the Purple 20 Express that operates on the weekends to provide access to the mall. We have the Purple 21 Express, and that is a route that we are very proud of because we use um, a Proterra bus, which is an all-electric vehicle. There's a charging station at the Holyoke Transit Center, and there's a charging station at Union Station Springfield. So the bus goes from one facility to the other. It's express service and it's actually very popular. We also have a route, the R24, that provides service within what's called the paper city. So it's just within the city, the downtown, the urban core of Holyoke. And then we have the uh, urban radio routes that go outside. We have the R29 that provides service from Amherst to the Holyoke Mall via 116, so it has access to all the colleges. Um, Mount Holyoke, Hampshire College, on its way down into the Holyoke Transportation Center and then the Holyoke Mall. And then we have what we call the village connectors. Uh, the B23 connects the city of Westfield to Holyoke via the Holyoke Community College. And the R41 is Northampton to Holyoke Community College via East Hampton. So we rely on the transit center that's here at Veterans Park on Maple Street to connect the north and the south portion of our system. So we use the routes that come into Holyoke to make that connection and make it possible for people from Springfield to access the north, the north side of our system. And as I mentioned before, we also have paratransit service, and that service is provided on the same days and the same hours as the fixed route. And in the city of Holyoke, last year, we carried 22,000, almost 23,000 passengers. Um, and then the following page has each of the routes and the ridership. As you can see, what we call the Tier 1 routes, the Purple 20, the Tier 2, have the highest ridership. Almost a million passengers, that's a very, very popular route. Standing room only sometimes. And I just wanted um, just to make sure that you understand the way that PVTA is funded. PVTA is funded with state, federal, local, and um, an assessment that's provided to the communities. We also receive grant funds, and that's what we consider the federal uh, portion of it. But we rely on the communities that provide, that we provide service to, as well as the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the largest source of revenue for us is the state contract assistant, which is the state of Massachusetts. And in order for us to have uh, a really robust transportation system, we need to make sure that we are financially stable Last year, as you may know, we cut service. We cut $1.2 million worth of service. And the reason we had to do that is because um, the administration provided a budget to PVTA that was fiscal year 2015 level. So as you know, the cost of service increases. We have to pay for labor. We have to pay for fuel and insurance. Those are the three largest uh, budget items in the PVTA budget. and. If we don't keep abreast of the cost of increase in service and we are funded to three years before, uh, that resulted in $1.2 million worth of uh, service that was cut. 
Uh, we did extensive public hearings for that. I've been told by MassDOT, which provides the funding for the RTAs, to expect level funded funding for fiscal year 2019. Uh, we are having a board meeting on Wednesday, and we had a committee meeting for the root committee and the finance committee meeting today, and I informed them of that decision that for planning purposes, they're asking us to do that. If we are to do that, we will have a large impact on the service that we deliver because labor increases almost by 3% every year, and our largest portion of our budget is the drivers. And we have fuel that continues to increase. Like I mentioned, we have 181 buses, and we have 141 vehicles that need to be fueled every day. And in addition to that, everyone's suffering the same thing with the allocation of insurance coverage. And um, we are very concerned about the type of service that we'll be able to deliver next year. MassDOT has also requested that the Transit Authority increase their fares. PBTA has not increased their fares since 2008. We are by far the lowest fare in the Commonwealth, and also with uh, analysis of peer systems over size. It's $1.25 to ride the bus. A lot of people qualify for the elderly and the disabled fare, and that's half the fare. And we also have uh, passes and uh, one-day passes, weekly passes and monthly passes. Uh, we're looking into uh, elasticity. A study has been done of how much the fare should be increased to, what will make it easier for people. I know we, we are very concerned because of the population that we provide service to is transit dependent and how that's going to affect them. Uh, but at the same time, we have to demonstrate to Mass DOT that we're doing everything to increase revenue, and we have done that. We have cut. Um, uh, the way that we fund certain programs. We have um, made a decision that anyone that leaves the authority is not being replaced. Uh, we have also made um, insurance and the insurance um, premiums that we pay and the insurance coverage that we have. We asked for the, um, the deductibles to be higher so that we could have a lower premium. Uh, we have done um, internal analysis of the staff and the people that we need to maintain the service. So we're doing everything that we can in-house to control cost. Uh, but there are, like I mentioned before, the higher costs for us are labor, fuel, and insurance. So I just wanted to make sure that you're aware of that, that as the years go by, if we continue to be level funded, uh, we are going to really affect the way that we deliver the service to the residents of our region. So we, we are um, like I said, we're looking for support as we reach the new uh, budget season, whether the governor puts out a budget for House 1 in January and what that's going to look like. That's going to affect what PVTA will deliver for July 1st of 2018. So we're looking to work with the state to try to get a larger portion of the state contract assistance so that we could actually improve our service. Uh, whether it is a dedicated source of revenue, whether it's an increase on the sales tax. I know that you talked to uh, Tim Brennan from PVPC, and I know he's a big proponent for the fair share amendment, and we are right behind him on that, because we think if we are allocated a certain portion of money, we can provide uh, transportation services to our residents that is really robust and will meet their needs. Um, I have some information on the back that shows how the service area is going to get older and how there will be a larger need of transportation for the elderly and the disabled. Uh, a larger portion of our population will become elderly, 65 years or, or over, and so we expect an increase in our paratransit demand of 2%. The delivery of paratransit service, although it's not our largest um, ridership, it is our largest cost. Every trip that we provide on the paratransit system costs $28. And every treat that we provide on the fixed route costs $2.50. Mm. The fare for the fixed route is $1.25, and the fare for paratransit cannot be more than twice of the fixed route, so we only charge $2.50. And there's a lot of, like I mentioned, the, the population is increasing, and there's a lot of demand for this service. So we are um, 
uh, trying to figure out the best way for us to deliver that. We're looking into separating the dial a ride program, which is just the senior transportation from the disabled transportation, and work with the different communities and council on agents to see if they could assist us with providing that transportation at a lower cost. We currently have a pilot program with Northampton, the city of Northampton, and the town of East Long Meadow, Long Meadow, and Hamden. And they are uh, took over providing the dial a ride service for the seniors at a reduced cost. Uh, and we provide the ADA transportation in those communities. We, um, we subsidized our service, so we pay for their trip. Uh, they, for instance, the town, the city of Northampton is providing the service for $10 as opposed to us going through a unionized or organized type of union where we have to pay $28. So, like I said, we're trying to show um, everyone that we're trying to uh, look at different ways on how we provide service. There's a lot of transportation needs, and right now I feel that um, I have come in to try to maintain the service that we have instead of having the opportunity to improve on the service. If you have a more robust transportation system, more people will use it because it will be reliable instead of the bus coming every 20 minutes or every half an hour. If you have a bus that's constantly coming every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, people can actually say, oh, the next bus is going to be in 15 minutes. Um, I unfortunately missed the bus this morning and I had to wait at Union Station for 20 minutes and it was very cold. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, just that, the way that you plan your trip as well. And transportation, as we all know, improves the quality of life of people. And we as a region need to work together to make sure that we can prioritize what is important to the region in order for the transit system to be able to deliver that service. So my intent, and thank you for the invitation, is to visit each community and let them know where we are and what we're doing to improve service, maintain service, and what we're doing to make sure that we're cost efficient. Uh, we're all fighting for the same pot of money at the state level, and we have to show that we're doing everything that we can to provide the best transportation possible for our residents. We do have a meeting with MassDOT uh, November 21st, and we are going to present to them that we need to get the resources um, just to maintain the service that we have and how important it is for our region. Like I said, we are the largest regional transit authority, and I think they should um, fund us a little bit differently than just put us all together with the RTAs and give us a percentage of what's allocated to them. We're not obviously as big as the MBTA, but being twice the size of Worcester and, I mean, our budget compared to the other ones, it's uh, really uh, high. So I just wanted to give you that information about PVTA and just open it up for any questions that you may have. Okay, wow, that was a lot, machine. I really appreciate it. So um, a lot of background. So I, I'll just, I'll just start with a, uh, with a thank you for, for being here, as I indicated. Um, the, uh, The, the, the transportation center uh, here in Holyoke, we're, we're really proud of it. So it's really become a, you know, kind of an iconic part of the downtown. It's really kind of starting to transform that that area. And then the, um, <clears throat> uh, and then the PVTA Picnelli Center is, it's uh, along with HCC. It's again, it's it's just it's well maintained. So we're pretty proud of that. Well, I'm also I also like the fact that there's security out there mm -hmm. on a regular basis, either a uniformed police officer or a, uh, or a kind of a, um, uh, a third party vendor that does security work. So that, that, that makes it nice because I've certainly witnessed myself a couple incidents over there. I mean, the, the population, I mean, I'm just gonna be real with you. You know, the population on, on PBTA buses is um, in Holyoke, it's, uh, it's, not a high in, it's not a high income population. Okay, and it's mainly minority uh, or elderly. Um, so, so one of your one of your um, profit centers is you know you didn't even mention uh, well you mentioned passing um, that you collect fares, but you've mentioned state, federal, local. But you know, you know your your fare income. Uh, I don't know what you do to market the PVTA, but uh, the number of times I've taken the PVTA service is. Um, you know, you you don't see a lot of professionals on on your on your transport services. Even the Express to Springfield, mm 
Now, that's okay. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying there's a market there that you're not reaching. So, I mean, I, I'm, uh, and then, then uh, you know, what I, what I see is that the PVTA buses are, you know, usually pretty clean. The drivers um, generally show up on time. Quite often, they do not. I mean, three, four minutes late, they saunter out, and they're wise guys when they come out. I've seen that myself. Uh, do not appreciate it. Now, I'm not in a position at that point to say anything, um, but now I'm saying it to you, and now you heard it from me first. For, you know, I've seen it myself. Yep. So come out when they damn well feel like it, and then with, with an attitude. So, so, so that, that doesn't happen often, but it happens, it happens enough um, to see that. Uh, I also want to mention, for, for my opinion, the PVTA bus stops are pretty well maintained. I'm glad you guys put uh, trash receptacles there. Um, and I see that they're fairly well maintained. I was a little disgusted when the center was down and you were wrapped around Veterans Park and there's trash everywhere. Um, in fact, I, I know I wrote a letter to you about it and it, frankly, nothing got done, but you know, ultimately time heals all wounds and you, know, you went back to the transportation center and we have a park and rec department that cleaned up after, the, after um, your users, if you will, your, your, um, the users of us. But, um, there was a lot of a lot of the passengers would trash Veterans Park, trash everywhere. So that was disappointing. But I generally see it, uh, you know, pretty clean around the areas. Um, so that that makes me happy. One of the things I get I get frustrated with is the um, sometimes we see PVTA signs just kind of appear. I mean, PVTA has to have a, a city council order an ordinance yeah yeah it's an ordinance right sometimes what we just bus you know stops come up you know we've also passed here that pvta i know for right in front of fall city towers that it, that it be relocated south to the corner of corner of was it south yeah, yeah. corner of jackson and and maple mm -hmm. um and, now and one of the things i want to ask is that is that quite often i'll see like just just on maple street um it's, it's fine that there's a stop at Fall City Towers. Does there have to be a stop, you know, a block before that in front of um, Our Lady Perpetual, I'm sorry, Our Lady of Guadalupe? I mean, and, and would, that, would that have an effect on, I mean, I would think less frequent stops would probably save gas. So, I mean, if they're clustered like that, you know, perhaps a, a rethinking. One of the things I just want to ask you right now, and I'll turn it over to anybody else who wants to, that's just my little laundry list of, of things. I probably have about a half dozen more, that, but I'll, I don't want to monopolize. Uh, and, and Councilor Roman's right after me. So, and I know Councilor McGivern has a question too. But um, the, um, oh, rats just lost my train of thought. Um, the, of course, I lost my train of thought. That's helpful. Um, I will say this: the when you mention the 21E, the the timeliness of that bus is is usually is usually spot on. Um, I will say Union Station now in Springfield has really become beautiful. So I hope you didn't stand outside the whole time. You can go could have gone in and get a coffee, and uh, at least you know so it's a really nice. Of course, 48 million dollars or whatever it was, it, it should be a should be fairly nice, right? Um, I think it was I think it was more than 48 million. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Ninety-four million. Thank you. So it, it ought to be nice, um, and, and it is. It, it's a it's a nice facility, and and we're and we're we're glad, uh, we're we're glad to have it. Uh, yeah. One other thing. Um, I think with the with the, and, and I liked how you, you mentioned you know the connection to Bradley Airport. That's really exciting to hear that. I, you know, and and we all know Mr. Picknelly. Well, we all knew Joe and I certainly knew the senior Mr. Picknelly, and 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 the young Picknelly's good. Yeah, you know, he's 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 a good businessman and all that. That's that's great. Um, but uh, to, you know, better connections to a, a transport center like like Bradley Airport is just boy, that's just vital. I, I want to ask you one thing: the the with the casino coming online, uh, you know, next year I think your Friday night direct service ends at. I don't know, six o'clock or something, and I think Saturday night ends at seven. And then going up to Northampton, you have actually like later hours, and they're not particularly late. Um, so I, I don't know if that's a way to, you know, to market yourself better, 
to have, you know, with those express buses to either Hamp or to uh, Springfield. Uh, I, you know, when at times I've been on them, those are, you know, that 48 bus and that 21E, those are really popular. Um, I, I did see in the paper that there was a, an incident yesterday in Springfield and State Street. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what happened, and we're not, we don't have to go there. But it sounded like, in, you know, through reading the article, there, there was a, and we're joined by Councillor Peter Tallman. Thank you, Peter, for coming. Um, that there was an incident with unruliness. I gotta be frank, I don't see that very often in Holyoke anyhow. And um, I mean, so there's there's that. I'm just, I don't know if there's anything else to, uh, from my perspective to, to add. I'm, I may come up, I may come back with another question or two, but. but, but Do you want me to answer? Yeah, if, if, you wanna, if you wanna respond to any of that. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, we are very pleased with the trans transportation center as well. We carry a lot of passengers from there to and from. And yes, it does have some operating costs and we are happy to be able to use the uh, Holyoke Police Department to provide a security service, especially in the uh, instances where the transportation center itself, where we're selling the passes and the tickets, is not open and they could have a presence there. So we appreciate the uh, ability to use the police department. Uh, we are aware that our passengers are not the highest income individuals, but I want to reiterate that they are workers and we are m making sure that we transport them to and from work. We are trying to uh, market to the uh, professionals. If you have a, um, I'm not sure if you have a smartphone, but if you go into your smartphone, you could get the PVTA app. It's called the PVTA app, the bus tracker, and you put your bus stops that are you know, if you put the transit center, it will tell you all the routes that come there and when they're coming. So if you're standing and it's seven o'clock or yeah, it's about seven o'clock, it will tell you which buses will be coming in there and the departure time. Um, we are trying to market to that population, but that population, it's more looking for a more robust type of system where the frequencies are closer as opposed to waiting 20 minutes or like the 48 that you have to pay, wait actually an hour for the next bus if you miss one of them. So I think we have to work to create a more robust system in order to really attract the choice riders. <clears throat> we do have some of them and you could see them that they don't live too far from the center where they work. We're also working with businesses to try to make sure that they know the services that we provide and that they get a tax, um, a tax break if they provide passes to their passenger, uh, to their employees. And, and so we're trying to just kind of do like a mass ride type of thing. Um, so we are working on that. It doesn't show as much as trying to get uh, the other type of population to ride our system. Um, regarding the cleanliness of the buses, um, I'm glad to hear that you say that. Uh, the times that I ride the bus, I feel that it could be better. And I've mentioned that to operations, um, that the vehicles need to be more attractive so that when you enter the bus, you feel welcome. Uh, we do have trash receptacles on the buses, and the reason why they have that is to make sure that if people have trash in their hands, they don't leave it where they are getting on the bus. They could actually get on the bus with the trash and put it inside the vehicle. The driver empties that at the end of the run or at the end of the day, depending on how full it is. Um, we, I know the councilman mentioned to me also two locations where there's some bus stop issues that were not addressed. I know Falsetti Towers, um, the operations were hoping that you will reconsider the request to relocate the bus stop because of the people that are transported at Falsetti Towers walking to and crossing the street. It's an inconvenience. I understand that you have requested that we do that and we will go ahead and do that, but if we're removing them from the front of the building and that will create require them to walk and some of them are disabled and elderly people and when it gets really cold, some, some of them wait inside. So um, I will go back to the office to make sure that we follow the ordinances and that we do what was requested and we will then monitor the bus stops and if we receive any complaints or anything like that, I'll come back and let you guys know. Um, about the frequency, we are doing an analysis of the distance between bus stops. We started with the city of Springfield where we have over 800 bus stops. Uh, there's a meeting with the mayor on the 16th to talk about the consolidation of the stops within the city of Springfield. We are reducing that to 500. We have to go through a survey process to make sure that we weren't leaving people 
outside that couldn't walk and get to the bus stop and this is my bus stop you're asking me to walk 100 feet I can't really do that so we were looking at each bus stop on a case-by-case -case basis then we're going to be moving to the outlying cities uh, Holyoke, Chicopee and all that it is true that the less you stop the more um, the faster the the transportation will be the stopping takes a little bit of time you get off, you get on. Most people pay with a fare that also takes a little bit of time. So we're trying to make it faster for people to get through uh, the fare box. And the casino, um, we are working with MGM. We actually have biweekly meetings with MGM. The agreement that they have with the cities and towns, especially with the city of Springfield, requires them to provide shuttle service to connect the different attractions and the different points of interest and transportation locations to the casino. So we have a shuttle uh, alignment that includes the Quadrangle Union Station, the different hotels in the area, the Basketball Hall of Fame, and the Armory. Right now, that's what it looks like and they are going to be funding that service. They're not sure if they're funding it the whole week or they're just doing Saturday, I mean Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, we are also aware that there will be a requirement for evening service, and we're working with a casino, with MGM, to try to um, leverage um, gaming commission funds to provide that service. We don't currently have the funds for that, and if we're level funded, we're really not going to have any funds to be able to do that, and we made it very clear to MGM that we will have to get some um, monies in order for us to provide that service, so they're working with us, lobbying the Gaming Commission uh, to make sure that when we submit our application, we have at least a chance for them to look at it. I know Commissioner Stebbins has requested information from PVTA through PVPC, and we've provided how much we believe the evening service will cost with the assumption that there will be no service reduction. So we're working on that right now. It only includes the city of Springfield, but as, as the casino comes on board, we will be looking to see what other communities will be having people go to the casino or be employed by the casino. Now, on your board, I mean, you have somebody from, from Holyoke. Uh, the I, uh, the yes, mayor. Okay. it's and, the mayor. And, okay, and, and the mayor or his agent is an active participant? Yes, he goes. He has been going through all the meetings since I started. I can't speak for from before. Awesome. And I know that he confirmed going on Wednesday. We have a board meeting on Wednesday. Okay, Councilor Romano. Yes, thank you. Thank you again so much, uh, Sandra, for being here. Um, specifically with regards to Falsetti Towers, um, that that concern was brought up, but this was actually a resident-led petition from the residents of Falsetti themselves requesting the move uh, because uh, underneath that, there's individuals smoking who are waiting for the bus, so it's going into their units, and there's people with oxygen masks, and we had, I think it was almost close to 80 of the residents sign that petition, um, so it was directly from the residents uh, who requested it, so you could take that back to the board and say please, and I share that with you as well. Um, I wanted to uh, back things up a little bit and say one, I, as a former user um, who was totally reliant and, and dependent, really applaud you and uh, PVTA for the service it does. I was one of those counselors, like a lot of my colleagues, who's extremely disheartened and really upset with this administration, this, the state administration for cutting funding. I think level funding isn't going to be great, especially if cost goes up for gas. And so I would like to publicly state on the record, I think that the governor should increase funding for PVTA. Um, I will continue to lobby that both with my constituents and my, myself here on the council. Um, and when Senator um, Hummison and Rep Vega are here, I constantly ask for increase of funding as well and I would like to see a supplement budget that actually increase and restores those funding services uh, specifically because I see Holyoke as that gateway city as you stated and I thank you for that to the north we specifically need more funding to increase those services to bring those communities down uh, and individuals from Northampton down to Holyoke as we see this uh, renaissance going on so I just wanted to applaud you for and again you don't have to go on record as saying anything because I know you guys are already trying to work to save that funding source but I just wanted to get that 
that on the record. Um, I personally just wanted to take a moment of personal privilege to thank you and your whole PVTA staff and team uh, for the Puerto Rico Maria relief efforts, uh, the personal PVTA members uh, and your supervisors that would actually swing by Nueva Esperanza, which I'm the executive director of, and would drop off personal items or relief items for Puerto Rico and donations that they got from riders. Um, I would have to say it was almost like two or three bus filled. Like that's how often the PVTA supervisors and drivers in their own personal cars would come. So thank you on behalf of the staff and the community for your donations. Um, a few things, um, I am a millennial, so I do have the app and the tracking of the bus um, app and the whole PVTA app, including your Facebook and social media page, they're not updated regularly or frequently. So as a millennial, for example, today when I checked before this meeting, there's still pictures up of Halloween. Like Halloween's been passed. It's now the middle of November. Let's get the ball rolling. But I see that as a great revenue source, specifically on the app. Um, another thing to consider is having Wi-Fi in all the buses that then when users click into, there's an ad that then pops up before they can use the free Wi-Fi. And then you can make advertising dollars off of the free Wi-Fi service, which might attract than professionals if they're on the bus. You know, we live in that age. But um, we've seen it in other communities where they have that Wi-Fi service that's actually paid for through advertising dollars, which might help. And then on the buses themselves, I didn't realize how amazing your advertising rates are. Um, just the cost per month for that constant ad um, I think that that's another underutilized tool, and I'm not sure your advertising marketing budget, I don't want you to get into that with us today, but just as a way to increase that to millennials or businesses or even us, we were thinking about how do we get to those clients that we serve at Nueva, and I looked at the PVT bus, um, your rates are just phenomenal rates, so I really would consider pushing that out more. And then for me, it was that frequency of when I was in the city of Boston, for their parking meters necessarily was having that app. I'm not sure if you guys are looking into that technology. Or when I go to New York, there's no money exchanged anymore to ride the buses in New York. It's all digital or a card, the Metro cards. Uh, is that something that you, PBTA is looking into as far as cost effectiveness or like, it's just an easier way. You can go to the machines, make sure there's money in there, swipe the card, it's a quicker on and off the bus cycle. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to look at uh, Wi-Fi, right? Um, with regards to the city of Holyoke and the fact that, you know, we are a city of a hill and there's up the hill, down the hill, and we have great services within South Holyoke and the signs are newer and nicer, like my counselor colleague was saying, but even if the signs could be, have some kind of cool lighting or something, some of these areas in Holyoke are really not well lit, uh, and so the signs don't effectively stick out. So some kind of a new lighted sign or reflective sign or solar lit sign would really be helpful because even though it has a reflective shield, some of these neighborhoods are really dark and you really can't see them. So I'll rest with that. So that's all my list of stuff I wanted to say. Councilor McGivern. Thank you, Sandra, and welcome. Um, I have to, <coughs> excuse me, I have to admit the, uh, your presentation was most informative and pleasant and much more pleasant than the usual PVTA relationship we have. And I'm not, you know, I'm saying telling you anything you don't know, but it's a rocky road. The, the mayor is our one rep on the board. You have a board and you have an executive board. We have an advisory board. Sorry, we have an advisory board and the votes are weighted votes and it depends on the total miles in each community and the ridership. So the city of Holyoke has quite a bit and in, in the weight of the vote and what they vote on. On the advisory board. Correct. But there is an executive board. No. There's no executive board. No, there are uh, committees or subcommittees of the advisory board. There's a finance committee, there's a paratransit committee, a route committee. I think those are the only three committees. Okay. Oh, and there's the one for uh, selecting the administrator. And the, the committees make decisions on their own or it goes back to the, the full board? They make recommendations to the full board. The board is the only one that's allowed to increase fares, change service, and fire and hire the administrator. The, um, you have a good understanding of how the an ordinance works and why an ordinance is needed. Um, just a, a thought is the ordinance shouldn't be created after the bus stop is put in. The ordinance should be talked about before the bus stop is created, moved, or, or deleted. And if you do see a lack of need for a, a, uh, a bus stop, we would appreciate knowing it was being removed so we could delete the ordinance itself. Um, sometimes we have to do that administratively years later. The, 
Hoyoke is, is the center, and, and it is a great transportation center over here on Maple Street, and I think it's, I think it's working well, and we, we had some disagreements on parts of it in the beginning, but we seem to get through that. Um, is it a, a funnel for the towns that are north of us, where buses come in and then leave to go besides the college system, you know, the whole Northampton? It is. You, you have the routes that connect Northampton to Holyoke, and then you could connect anywhere else in the system because from Holyoke you could go to Westfield, you go to Springfield, Chicopee, and then once you get into Springfield you could go anywhere else in the system around the city and either side, whether it's West Springfield and whatnot. So it is basically a gateway. We won't be able to connect the north and the south any other way. Uh, we come from Northampton across the river and you come from Amherst through 116, through the flats, into uh, the transportation center. So yeah, the center is very important to us. So without putting words in your mouth, you might want to tell the advisory board that that should give Hoyoke a little bit more weight because we're providing a service for PVTA. One, one thing I noticed, I think Nelson brought it up, was these new signs. Is there also a digital part of the new sign that has a tracking of buses? Yes, and we, we are rolling that out uh, at some shelter locations. We started with the Academy of Music in Northampton. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue that we have is that the signs need electricity, and not all of the shelter locations in our system have electricity. So we're working right now with the city of Chicopee, the bus stop on Center Street right across from City Hall. Uh, the mayor's trying to get electricity to that shelter so that we could put a sign. So we, I guess we were eager uh, to get the signs and then realize it was a lot harder to get electricity because of the metering. They don't just want to meter one shelter. You know, they want to meter the whole thing. And so we're trying to work on that. We're also looking at solar lighting for bus stops. Uh, because it's easier for us to do that, but it depends on the location and how much light it will get. Uh, some of the rural bus stops in our system, Williamsburg, Sunderland, um, you know, the, the outside areas of Westfield and all that, going into um, the Holyoke Community College that, that travel on Route 20 and 202, uh, those locations we're looking into setting up uh, solar panels to light up those uh, bus stops. Yeah. And just lastly, I, I think the system is, um, any transit system is well needed, especially in urban uh, areas like where we live. Um, and certainly recognize, you know, the importance of the PVTA, but the so-called, you know, partnership that we do, we do, uh, um, I think, participate in, in a sense of helping each other out. And level funding, in, in Hoyoke we say level funding is not level service, and you already cited that, and we understand that. If there's anything we can do, and perhaps our council would pass a resolution and try to work with the state, um, the DLT, and with the state, our, our um, delegation of uh, reps down there too, maybe we could uh, get a little bit of fire lit under them to, to help you out in that area, because I think any more cuts at this time could be devastating. and and hopefully the uh, Gaming Commission will come through too. Thank you. Yeah, but. no, I, I agree with you. That's very important to us. Like I said, I, I came in and my thought was to let's, let's try to increase our service, let's do all this different stuff, and I find myself trying to go everywhere to say we need to maintain our service. I just want to maintain the service instead of making service reductions. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Sandra. Could you could you tell me a little bit more about the Paper City Express? I see that's got the lowest ridership. What the route is like, and uh, the route just connects uh, the, basically the downtown area. So it goes in the downtown. Um, I, I wish I I was going to bring a schedule for it, and just to give you a more specific alignment for it. And that's why the ridership is lower because you have the other routes in the other streets, this is just kind of connecting them to where people might not have service. Um, in 2014, PVTA did a comprehensive operational analysis of what was needed, and it came out that the city of Holyoke needed to connect the different um, silos within the city and then connect them to the major routes. And so the, the I don't know if you could get the, the schedule and the map in it, and it kind of does a little portion of the flats 
and some of the, like you said, the highs and the lows, because there's a lot of hills within the city of Holyoke, but it's mostly the downtown where there's a lot of housing. And so I don't know if it will show you the alignment. And it does have the lowest ridership because it is really a short route. It's not a long route like the Purple 20, and it doesn't have a major destination and a major um, origin. It's mostly let's connect the people so that they could get the services that they need. And that was basically the purpose of that route. I understand. I mean, just looking at the numbers, it would seem like, um, unless I'm doing my math wrong, we're getting like maybe just 70, 70 people. Possibly, yes. 70 and we use a smaller a vehicle as well for that service. Yeah, 70 people a day? Mm-hmm. So like I said, when we looked at um, service modifications and things like that, okay. so I mean, it'd be safe to say the main person, you know, besides just circling around the city, it would be a, circulate the different stops and get them to the transportation hub on Maple Street. Right. Yeah. And, and that the the hours on that or it I think it's the minimum service. Six to six it looks like. Yeah, six to six. On Monday through Friday and then nine. No service on weekends. Yeah, on the hour. So it's very limited service. It's just, it's just when just you on the hour. at every hour. It's, on the hour. it's just a basically a shop and medical um, as a wait so that they wouldn't if you could use the bus instead of the paratransit or you didn't have to take another bus to take you another way to get to that location to make yeah. the trip shorter. No, I'm, not, I'm not criticizing, I'm just, uh, if, I look, if I break it down, we're, we've mm -hmm. got probably about eight people an hour, yeah. seven and people an hour taking advantage of this. It's, it's uh, an area we could maybe improve on or uh, we, uh, do a little more advertising or ma making yeah. it uh, knowledge that it's available I mean that's pretty pretty slim picking so uh, is that in danger of not being it is the ones that have the lowest ridership um, in the whole system as a whole based on uh, passengers per mile and passengers per hour will be the ones that will be um, really looked at and presented to the public to get comments of whether we can keep the service or not and that's what we did the last time I just have a follow-up and I think my colleague brings up a great question just in terms of the way that the R24 is configured it's only the upper half of the hill mm -hmm. uh, and it only services one stop and shop and not both okay um, so it does the stop and shop on Lincoln Street which is the less trafficked as far as like transient populations who might need buses it's a lot more cars people drive in it's like less of a destination versus the other stop and shop has Kmart it has a whole strip mall uh, and maybe even stretching that down to like the main street corridor where people might need a little bit more of a frequent. But I agree with my colleague. I, I didn't even know that that service existed, believe it or not, until tonight. Um, uh, but I think that maybe reconfiguring those uh, to maybe hit the two. But I do like the fact that it does stop at Holyoke Hospital. I think that's good. Um, but I think that maybe, like my colleague said, reconfiguring yep. and then allowing, because now that I know that exists, I'm actually going to share this on social media tonight and say, hey, there's this other service that's provided. Um, and I just think that that's something that might be a good benefit because if we know that, and, and even the smaller bus model too, a lot of times when I was a rider and I saw that small, I thought that that was only for elderly or only for para individuals so maybe even if it's a signage like on the smaller bus saying open to everyone so when it's doing the routes you don't think that it's just because if that stopped in front of Holyoke uh, Medical Center and I saw that I think that that was just for medical clients so maybe even some kind of signage saying open to everyone I think would also increase it we might use a, a 30 footer instead of the larger vehicles not so much of a smaller one but I'll check on that okay. as yeah, well yeah, sure. thank you well I, I guess this is Councilor, you, are you good to go? Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, I, I yeah, because we're we're here, we're getting close about the hour mark, and that's that's about the witching hour. So, um, we've got, you know, believe me, we we could go on and on, but, and I know we could. I I hope we can invite you back again, or 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 if you know maybe your assistant administrator come back when you're getting a little close, because, I mean, I mean, I know you always say, well, you know, we 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 heard from the public. And you know we took public well, 
Public comments in Holyoke is one thing. <laughs> public comments in Amherst, when they've got nothing else better to do but show up at a public hearing, you know, about 75 professors show up and they have nothing better to do, so they just overwhelm. Yes. So it's, it's, a little bit, it's a little bit skewed, um, in, in, in my opinion. Again, we just don't have the population that, that, that's going to be um, necessarily coming to a, uh, to a meeting like, like that. But that's part of the reason why we had Tim Brennan here and yourself. It was at, least you, at least you get to meet us at the, uh, the elected officials. And by the way, all of us won, so we're all, we're all coming back for two years, for the next two years. So, <laughs> so, there's, so there's that. Um, so hopefully it may be before we, uh, before we start reconfiguring things, if you want to reach out to any of us, um, or me in particular, um, we can, I can disseminate from there. But, um, uh, you know, my just closing remarks are thank you for your time. Thank you for, um, for, the, for the work you do in the PBTA that it does. Um, well, my, my complaints, uh, you know, I don't mean to, you know, emphasize that. I mean, I, I think overall, like, the service is very good. Um, and then we and we realize it's a question of financing. So so, but we're we're hopeful that we can find any way to work with you and and uh, improve uh, public service uh, transportation service. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. And at any time that you need anything, you have my business card. Please feel free to call me. Doesn't matter what type of complaint it is. We can only improve the service if we address the issues that people have. So please. Um, any time that you have any issue and you get on the bus and like this bus is late, the driver is, is not here or whatever it is, just let me know. I also use the system. I think um, uh, it's you can only do this job if you see what the passengers are experiencing. And, and I think that's very important and I think that's my philosophy in trying to make sure that we deliver the best possible service and try to attract different uh, people. But at any time, please know that we um, did uh, go through a survey process at the Transportation Center to get feedback from the passengers of when it will be the best time to present to them changes, so public participation process. And we got that information. Uh, I speak Spanish, and so I will be able to do any of the hearings or any of the type of populations or any locations where they may have may want to meet, I'll be able to conduct the meetings as well and provide them the information. And we are available to go to any locations to provide transit information. Uh, like I said, we have um, bilingual staff and, and we will be able to do that. So if you have a need at your location, uh, the new Esperanza, I believe you said, we will be happy to go there. We are working with the new North Citizen Council for the refugees that are coming to the city of Springfield as well. So we want to make sure that we can provide the transportation services that are needed. Thank you very much for having me. Okay, okay Mr. Thanks, Mr. Sir. Sir. Thank you. And if our mayor doesn't show up to any meetings, just let us know and we'll replace them. <laughs> and so if I could just get a motion to sort of comply with. M motion to the orders comply with. Second. On a motion, all in favor? Aye. Okay. Aye. Uh, and then um, <coughs> I think we should probably just take Suspend and take three, four, five, and six as a package. So moved. Um, on the motion to uh, take three, four, five, and six as a package, all in favor? Aye. Aye. And then uh, and take them off the table, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, okay so we have uh, special permit, uh, why don't you come in, uh, special permit applications from Cellco Partnership. Wow, what a great name that is. <laughs> CP, I think it means CO, Care of Verizon Wireless, to put up. Um, <coughs> Wireless service for telecom wireless wireless service facilities for telecom services at the following addresses in Holyoke: 302 Chestnut, 177 West Street, 2217 Northampton Street, which I believe is Kmart Plaza, and 532 South Bridge Street. So. My favorite company, Verizon Wireless. Um, so this, let's see, is complied with. That's tabled. Um, so, um, Councilor, why don't you just introduce yourselves and, and your and the guests, the, the microphones. You, you just hit a button right in front of you. That's it. And um, you can tell us um, who you are and. Why you're here and what 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 can we do for you? 
Hi, uh, good evening. I'm Ellen Fryman. I'm with Schatz, Schwartz, and Fenton in Springfield, and I represent Verizon Wireless. Uh, this evening, I'm with uh, Jay Latore. He's the radio frequency engineer with Verizon Wireless, and uh, we have a representative from Hudson, uh, not from Hudson, I'm sorry, from Proterra, Jesse, Jesse Marina, sorry, and Mike Libertine is with um, All Points, um, and he is um, our consultant and has done the visuals that um, we have delivered to you and that we'll go over tonight. Okay, so Ms. Fryman, so, so you're, you're the council. Uh, Jay, you are with Verizon and, and your, func your function correct. is what? I'm a radio frequency engineer. Engineer, okay. Uh, Jesse, you are with whom? And Mike, all points is what? We're the uh, environmental consultant. Is a uh, mic on, is, is a green button on? Yes, it is. Okay, just pull the mic closer to you then, because sure. you're, you're not, or pull yourself closer. Okay, all right, consultant engineer. Okay. So um, there was a need for better service in the uh, in the city. And uh, we were fortunate to find existing buildings in which we could uh, locate our antennas on the roof. So we're here to, um, we have three uh, downtown buildings that are residential buildings that we would uh, install two antennas on each of the roofs. And then uh, the Kmart Plaza, which is um, you know, also uh, a rooftop installation. So um, we have plans that we can just show you what the design looks like and um, and then we have we can talk about the coverage and then we can look at the visuals and see what the impact will be so sounds good all right and jesse if you want to okay is there any particular order we want us to go in or no yeah you, you carry the ball <laughs> just uh just have the microphone with you just carry it around like your monty hall and um if i could make a suggestion jesse why don't we talk about small cells two three and four because i think the designs are um very similar in nature and then we can talk about small cell six, which is uh, in the Kmart Plaza, which is a little different, but again, I think the counselors will see very similar design. No, it's, it's, it's all one piece, just kind of, just, yeah, that's it, there, there you go, <laughs> yep. Um, as Jay said, uh, two, three, and four are very similar. They're all residential structures. Um, all built, you know, uh, early 20th century. Um, they're in various locations. I'll start with Chestnut Street first. Um, this one here is closest to Town Hall. I believe it's sort of in that direction. So what we have here is a residential neighborhood similar to what you guys have all around here in, in, in Holyoke. Um, and it's the building that we have. It's on a small lot. Um, this is a four-story structure, and uh, we're looking to put uh, antennas on the roof. Um, this this technology, small cell, we can Jay can talk a little bit more about it, but it's not your full array tower type system. Um, it's a it's a much smaller footprint, um, and uh, the antennas that we're using here are uh, much smaller. They're sort of maybe 12 inches diameter by. 24 to 38 inches tall, something like that. And we don't need big cabinets. We don't need the big tall structure. We're trying to utilize um, a, a co-location on a, an existing structure here um, to, to, to do this. So in this particular location, um, we're on the roof. It's about a nine by nine uh, area, uh, about 10 feet tall. We have a couple of antennas, associated radios and uh, electrical equipment. Um, utilities are fed within the existing building. So it's a pretty fo uh, small footprint there. Uh, this is pretty typical of the first three examples. They're all basically the same, but um, fairly low impact. Um, we're really looking at a you know an eight by eight, nine by nine area, um, small cylindrical antenna, about a foot in diameter, about three feet tall, and. Uh, some sort of toaster oven style or toaster oven sized uh, equipment boxes that would go that go on there. So pretty pretty low impact as far as visual is concerned. Um, 
that's the first site. Okay. Uh, the other two are, are very similar. I can go over those with you, or do you want to stop and look at the visuals for that one? Probably have it in your package there. I'm not exactly sure. From a visual standpoint, uh, we did do simulations for each of these installations. Um, when we were out in the field looking at the view lines, one of the things that jumped out to me was taking advantage of being off the very edge of the building and set back a little bit. Um, and because of the height of most of these buildings, you really don't get views except from intersecting streets and in all cases from just one of the intersecting streets. Um, varies obviously with each of the buildings um, and again the small cell technology is really a very low profile um, single array as opposed to some of the other building mounts that you may see where uh, Jay is trying to accomplish uh, shooting out in several directions this is a much more concentrated um, installation it still provides um, coverage to multi directions but it's done within this canister effect um, what we tried to do was to give you a good representation from each um, of these facility or proposed facilities uh, again from the most prevailing view and uh, that should be in your packages but again the uh, I've been doing this for about uh, 20 years or so and the real advantage of the small cell uh, installations is again really minimizing overall visibility so you're not looking at a lot of infrastructure. Um, in a lot of cases you just will not see these. As a matter of fact, in standing out in front of any of these buildings because of the heights that we're dealing with um, and the concentration and the narrowness of the streets, you really don't see them from any kind of a head-on uh, perspective. Again, it's mostly from uh, intersecting streets at those corners if you look back and know what you're looking uh, at. And again, most of these buildings have some form of uh, rooftop infrastructure already so it's not something that's jumping out or, or absolutely jarring as uh, you might have um, you know otherwise and so what's the benefit to Holyoke Huge I'll take Jay. it. I'll take that question. <laughs> uh, so, good evening again. My name is Jay Latori. I'm a radio frequency engineer with Verizon. Um, the benefit to Holyoke is that uh, what we have seen in our industry uh, is, and I, and I have a, a stat here. I'll share with you. In between 2013 and 2018, usage on wireless networks or LTE networks, which is the latest generation of wireless technology that all carriers use has grown uh, is expected to grow roughly 650 percent so if you think about kind of the history of where we've gone from with you know wireless devices we started in the 90s of just being able to uh, make phone calls uh, sporadically when we had service in cities to ubiquitous networks that covered the entire country and then in the mid 2000s we now had texting service and could start to use email and uh, you know Towards 2010, you started to see the iPhone and devices that allowed us to surf the web. Um, and de demand for our services as new technologies becomes available just uh, has become more rampant. You know, um, you have cars with um, you know wireless technologies built into them. You can stream um, video. You can um, you know uh, use social media and all all sorts of other things. And um, those are just personal uses. The impact to businesses is, is significant as well. More businesses are using wireless technology to, um, you know, uh, take care of their point of sale for interacting with customers. Uh, small businesses are using wireless technology to create connected offices so uh, that their employees can move around from their office space to their shared space uh, and, you know, interact with their colleagues. So. Uh, demand for our services is only continuing to grow and one of the ways that we can help ensure um, that our customers who use our service um, continue to get the same quality and level of speed of service uh, that they expect and one of the ways that we can ensure that residents and businesses in the city of Holyoke have availability to our services which will, will allow them to continue to grow um, is with these proposed small cell deployments. Um, they, they really work to in concentrated areas of roughly 
you know, 750 to 1,250, um, you know, feet in a radius uh, provide um, a large amount of data capacity, which helps these customers uh, and businesses um, maintain service at a, uh, a level that allows them to uh, use their services effectively. So how do you let them know? So what, what are, you, are you saying that, uh, are you marketing Holyoke? Are you saying it's more, we're, we're more conducive to attracting business? I mean, so what, it's a big deal. I mean, so are you putting stuff on towers? Or are you telling people this or what, what, are, you, what, are, you, what are you doing? So, so here's what we do. So first of all, you know, let me talk a little bit about why are we here? So one of my responsibilities as a radio frequency engineer is to constantly evaluate our services and how they're performing. And um, this design came out of the fact that we look at our existing infrastructure and, and in the case of small cells two, three, and four, um, our infrastructure, those areas of Holyoke are covered by our existing facility on Essex Street. And we start to see the strain on the network month over month as more people use our services. Um, that's really what drives our need to deploy these um, additional facilities to try and keep up with the growth uh, and need for services. What we do is when we um, activate these facilities, uh, Verizon is a company that communicates between its network team and its marketing team and its sales team. Uh, so our marketing and sales folks will um, have community partners, maybe Verizon customers that are today or other businesses that may not be Verizon customers that with these facilities in place uh, and enhance coverage in the area. Our sales teams and marketing teams can feel more confident about engaging those customers to see if they're interested in our services, knowing that there's existing infrastructure invested nearby. Okay, that makes sense. So, Count Sullivan. So, um, first of all, like, uh, on these, is there an economic benefit to the owners of these property? Are they being paid a fee? Yes, we have a <laughs> lease agreement between Verizon and the owners. Yep. Okay. How much is that? As the RF engineer, I'm not sure what the lease terms are for that. We're we're the permitting people, not yeah. the leasing people. So we don't we get the we get to move on with the permitting after the lease is done. So we're not involved with that process. Okay. I mean, one of the things I'd want to know is these property owners are up on their taxes and uh, all their fees. We have to get, when we filed the application, we had to get a certification that taxes were paid currently. Definitely. Yeah, they, they have to get this. The, yeah, I had to get a certification first before <clears throat> I could go to the clerk's office with the application. I had to go to the treasurer's office, clerk's all right. office. All right, well, that answers that question. Um, as far as... Uh, this the one I'm looking at here for South Bridge Street. Now, this is going to does this also increase the speed of the um, like uh, wireless internet services in the area for the businesses? Exactly. So it does two really important things. So the first thing is that, um, and what I'm going to ask is, um, Ellen, could you let me know what tab the coverage maps are on, just so I can inform the counselors. Six. Okay, Six. so if you go to the um, application for Holyoke Small Cell 4, which is 532 South Bridge Street, and oh, you wait, said it's... 32, I'm sorry, that tab is 7. Oh, can you go to tab 7, <laughs> you're going to see um, radio frequency propagation maps. And um, what I'm going to ask is that you skip over the first two. And, um, oh, do you have them, Jesse? Okay, great. No, I don't. Oh no, you don't. Okay, okay. Well, that's okay. Well, the the title of the um, the title of the map says Holyoke Small Cell Two Three Four Twenty One Hundred Megahertz Current Best Server. So what you're seeing on this map is basically coverage from two of our existing facilities uh, in Holyoke. One of them is uh, just called Holyoke, and that's on Essex Street, and the other one is called Holyoke East, and that's on South Street. Um, and what the colors are, there's a, there's a bright green for the Holyoke East facility, and there's a little bit of a darker green or, or teal, if you will, for the uh, Essex Street facility. What this is trying to convey to you is that today, these two facilities in particular, the Holyoke Essex Street, is providing service to basically all of South Holyoke. And it's really just coming from a single sector of capacity for that site. 
So if you look on the next page, it's the same map, but you'll see there's a couple of different colors, blue, yellow, pink. What we're effectively doing is when we activate the proposed facilities, should they be approved, all of these areas that have these different colors, when you're a Verizon customer in these areas, you're now going to use service off of this uh, small cell facility. Um, so here's what happens. If you're in, let's say, this pink area or this yellow area or your, this blue area, you're using a facility that has a significantly smaller footprint. It's going to have uh, less users on it, which means the speed and reliability that it can provide is really impressive. But there's another benefit to it as well. The existing facility that has a large footprint to it, now because it's shedded traffic, it's not taking as many customers, it now has more resources available to serve all the other customers in Holyoke who may be in areas um, that aren't currently uh, in range of the smaller facilities. So the folks that are far away, um, you know, get improved service um, just as much as the folks that are very close to the proposed facilities get improved service. That's what we call capacity offload in our industry. And it's part of what we uh, would call a densification plan. Okay. Yep. Yep. I got it. Council McGivern. Thank you. <clears throat> the, the two towers you, the locations you talked about are two elderly towers that are much taller than these three proposals downtown. Can you explain that? Are they working together or are they? Yeah, ab absolutely. So um, what happens in Verizon's network is um, as you move throughout the city, uh, your handset works to um, constantly understand which site is closest to and which site provides the best service and signal to you. And that happens through, you know, um, constant measurement between the facility and your handset. And when the facility makes the choice that I'm closer to this site, the Essex Street site, and I can get a better experience on this, it takes that phone and hands it off to that facility. And these proposed facilities will do the same thing. When you move away from, let's say, from Essex Street and you get closer towards the canal system and you're in range of one of these facilities, your handset will constantly, uh, consciously see that the signal strength and quality from one of these facilities is better, and it'll latch onto it. And then when you move away from it, um, it will latch back onto one of the larger facilities. And the purpose for that is really reliability. The customer has an expectation that whenever they're walking across the city, they're on the bus, they're, they're driving, that their experience is kind of, um, you know, unnoticeable to them as they traverse the various nodes in the system. And the Kmart Plaza proposed one, what area is that going to have a sure. impact on? Um, why don't we take a look? I don't think look. we have a map on that here. Yeah, we, we do actually. If you look in your application, and that's 2217 Northampton Street. Ellen, can you just let me know the tab for the coverage maps as well? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. That's six. Tab six. So this, this obviously is a little bit of a different, um, you know, purpose. So in the first three facilities, what we're really trying to do um, is provide um, a oh. capacity enhancement. Ellen, are you sure? <laughs> That's all I got in tab six. Are you, is it the one for um, uh, 2217 Northampton? We have one for each? Yeah. yeah. Oh. You, you want okay. it? Okay, like? I'll stand corrected. Here, you can use this one. That's no, right. I, I, sure. Okay. If anybody wants an extra one to look at. Well, so, so certainly um, the concept of this is the same, right? Improved coverage, more reliability, better indoor coverage. Um, the circumstances are a little bit different. So this facility was really designed, frankly, from some of my own experience. So I, I know that um, shopping plazas, restaurants, you know, are high drivers of demand for our services. Um, I'm also going to put in a plug for the road race because I run it every year, and I know um, – the amount of people that congregate every year in this area along Route 5 for the race. And one of Verizon's, you know, really important, um, you know, we consider an obligation to the community is making sure when we have high capacity events that we can manage the traffic, not only for our customers who want to upload photos and check their race times, but also to public safety who needs to make sure that they have constant communication between police, fire, and ambulance. And so we looked at the plaza, um, 
you know, and its vast array of businesses, small and large, is, is an area that really made sense for additional capacity enhancement. Um, again, the concept is the same. Um, the north of the plaza is that uh, Holyoke East facility, which is on uh, South Street, and then more um, southwest of the plaza is another facility we have really close to the mall on a Holy Family Road, but the concept's the same. If you're near the plaza, you'll be on this facility. If you move away from it, you'll go back to one of the larger facilities on rooftops in the city. Uh, to the end user, they don't notice the difference except for the fact that they see more bars, uh, stronger service, uh, more likely to have better service inside and maintain coverage on the network. David and I are both on the parade committee, and I think the uh, morning of the parade, that's where it starts, and the high concentration is uh, even greater than the day before road race day. But I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, and I, I think the benefit to Oyok is everybody has a cell phone, mm -hmm. and you don't have any dead spots, the more or less frequent not frequent, but less dead spots you have, the better off you have are in terms of service and good service. Are there any other locations? Do you, was there one on Beach Street? Um, in terms of existing Beach or and, proposed? Beach and Sergeant? Sycamore House, where Elmwood, um, Sycamore is. Um, no, that's the, that's the, uh, nine, the uh, one we just talked about. Yep. Okay. This um, is a, Beach a, an old smokestack on Beach Street. Okay. Uh, around yeah. Sergeant and Beach. So, oh, so I, I think mean. there is a facility on Beach Street. We are not on it, but I know that there are a number of, of competitor industries that are on okay. different smokestacks throughout the I'd be the glad facility. you're not on it because they're working on it and we're not aware of it and we're going to find out who's working on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'll, I'll just um, read just quickly into the, the record what we do have for existing facilities. Um, I mentioned yeah, South I Street. I mentioned... Um, Essex Street, and I just now mentioned Holy Family Road. Yeah. Um, we are also on a tower on uh, Appermont Highway heading towards um, Westfield on, yeah. I think it's 202. Mm -hmm. um, Delaney House. What's that? The Delaney House, too. Yep, Delaney we're on the Delaney House. house. In fact, I was going to say the Delaney House represents Verizon's first rooftop small cell application, which we put into place a couple of years ago. Yeah, um, we're, we're, we excited, we're excited to approve that. That was, we that was, that. yeah, we, we, we approved that. Yep. So we're, we're yep. for you for that. And one. then um, just also for the council's records, uh, in the last year we um, completed our installation at Holyoke Community College. Mm -hmm. um, that came on air, I think, at the beginning of this year, and that provides ubiquitous service all around the community college, and it's a yeah. really important investment for the city. Um, I, I appreciate every time, and, and no one usually lead the charge, and there's, familiar in some new faces, Jay. First time for us? <laughs> First time, yep. We appreciate it because you guys are always prepared, you know, and you have the answers, the maps, the locations, and there are other vendors that come in that sometimes aren't as prepared. Um, not that we have a lot to say about this, but we do want to be able to answer our constituency in terms of their questions of where, why, and, and how it works. Um, but thank you. Thank you for the presentation and do appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. The, um, I, I think going back to Councillor Sullivan's answer real quick is the permitting process, if we do our job right, the city, the assessors will be notified too. Right, because they get, their, right these there. are taxable personal property yeah. and, um, yeah, so. so that's Council, you all said Council? Councillor? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roman? Yes, um, so. I'm going to ask, does Verizon, again, because these are now properties where there's humans in living, so it's not a private business, it's not a private entity. Two of these properties are mine. Verizon agrees that these homes should be in the best condition for the tenants that are living in those buildings, correct? I'm sorry, I didn't... Verizon agrees that if they're going to be on top of rooftops providing rental income to a landlord, that the properties, that the tenants that are underneath should be maintained and in good standing, correct? Right. We don't have any control over the building itself. I mean, we, so. So Verizon will put it on top of a building if they make a lease and not care about the condition of the tenants underneath. Is that what you're telling me? I'm just saying we're, we're not involved in that, so in I the think management you be, of the cause, building. Because here's we have why, no control and I would like that. to enter this into the record for my colleagues. Two of these buildings are what we call in the hood a hot spot. Drug dealing, complaints. Two years ago, there was two individuals arrested for heroin out of these buildings. These are hot spots. And these landlords have health code violations, so I'm going to actually recommend to my colleagues we put a hold on this. I would like to see this put on the table because this, the owners of this property, three out of the four actually, 
are Mr. Tony Vizone, who lives in Florida, and uh, Risota E. Vizone, who lives in Linfield, Massachusetts. So when we talk about Otis City landlords and the problems with these tenants. I represent two of these buildings who I door knock, who I was just door knocking, and the do conditions of these units that these individuals are living in are not good, folks. And Verizon Wireless wants to put towers on top of it. So Mr. Tony Vizone and Risota Vizone, please reach out to Nelson Roman here in Holyoke, Massachusetts, 413-276-9480, because I would feel that any company who's going to do its homework looks into these conditions, and the tenants are not really happy with these buildings. And so I would like to actually table in order to go to the police department to pull the, the, the call log records and the police records for the last two years. And I would like to have the building and health inspector go in there to check the quality of these units. I do not feel comfortable approving corporate America paying a landlord who I feel is absentee to then benefit clients with their cell service when there's people who live in those homes. And there's individuals who have come from Puerto Rico who are staying in those homes who are doubled up. Bad conditions. I don't, you know, with all due respect, and, and I'm looking at the Kmart Plaza one on an empty spot that's been empty for years. And, you know, these landlords are going to get these rental re revenues and income. Great for cell phone service, but I can also tell you that in the neighborhoods that are surrounding these cell phone towers, those landlords have to do better. So when we're looking at a positive impact for the city, great, cell phone towers, great. But then to the residents and the people of the neighborhood, these two buildings are, are this glimmering, shining beacon of hope to put these towers on top of. Delaney House, great, great business, great person, great organization. We also have to look at the interior as well as the exterior. And so yes, it might physically be sound, but what are the quality of the units on the inside? And when I got the call earlier today, from you know my colleague Councilor Fenton, who's also worked for the attorney's office, and he gave me the two addresses. I went, I looked at the neighborhoods, including 177 West Street. So three out of the four properties are owned by the same landlord. And the 177 West Street, when I call my colleague, you know, Councilor LeBron Martinez, we have some issues. So I would actually recommend to my colleague, give me a day or two, or at least another hearing, to really pull these records to see if there's work that the landlord needs to do. And I know that's not anything because against you all. We would ask that these be separate, because this is a separate transaction. It's just, But you know, for me, it's not, not, because the landlord's getting that money, and this landlord has been the landlord for years and hasn't updated anything. So how am I now going to put money in his pocket when he's not even before us saying why this proposal is a great proposal? Because for every other cell phone tower, when there was Delaney House, not only did the landlord write a letter, but he was present in front of us saying why this is a benefit not only to the city, but to his business, Right. I, I can't in good faith conscious as a ward representative representing two buildings because it's not just a, it's not a business folks there's human lives at stake in this as well so you're going to the company Verizon Wireless is going to give money to this landlord who has to do some serious work in this neighborhood and in these buildings and then what's the landlord going to do if they haven't done anything for years Again, can you guarantee I mean, me that we, the, we don't have any control over that that's not the transaction but I as a ward council we're, have we're looking at the we're, we're renting a roof space and that's you know, all that is so the rental involved. amount that you're going to give that landlord is then going to help that landlord to make profits off of this building, well. which they're already doing with their rent, which is then not changing the lives of anyone. So I would like some time to do research to ensure that this landlord is contacted, that they know what is going on, and I want to know from them, I want to request it, how much are you going to make? What are you doing to invest or upgrade your properties? When's the last time you've been down to your properties? So we can have those conversations before I feel comfortable, like my colleague said, going back to my constituents, to say, and I'm a Verizon customer, throwing it out there, being transparent. Great, my cell phone service improved, but you're still doubled and tripled up in a home that very rarely is good. I'll just point out, that is not you know, any condition of the zoning um, ordinance to to deal with those kinds of issues. That's you know, not a requirement. We complied with all the requirements of the ordinance. And so we would ask that we move, be able to move forward with the, with the permit that we're seeking and have that as an independent issue. If there's concerns, you know, we're, we just uh, wouldn't be able to be involved with that. And that would be a separate matter and that's, that you would and take And exactly, that's why landlord. you represent Verizon Wireless and I represent the voters and the constituents of Ward 2. I can't in good conscience separate the two out of my head because in my opinion and view, mm -hmm. that's me supporting a company giving money to a slumlord who's out of the city. And so I, I have to hold the two accountable because if this is the wake-up call for that landlord to say, hey, you're not going to get an additional 2000 a month in your pocket from Verizon Wireless, let's come fix this building 
and then we could have that conversation. And I want to go do my due diligence. I have not heard from Verizon Wireless when it comes to double poles. I have not heard from Verizon Wireless when it comes to cutting down trees in my ward. And I did provide that with Councilor Fenton today to say, hey, I've been waiting for two years for any response. But when it comes time for let's add a tower, Verizon Wireless wants us to act. It's just a, um, and I did talk to um, to Mike about that. And uh, that's a separate company. You know, it's a landline versus Verizon Wireless. But I did make a call just because I know the people there. And um, I didn't reach them, but I left a message. And we said that we would do what we could to try to, to facilitate something, you know, because of the contact that we do have. Exactly. So, like I said, my colleagues, I'm going to recommend we table this until I'm able to get some answers from the landlord. I don't feel comfortable, but that's all I have to yeah, say. Thank you. Motion yet. Uh, Council Sullivan? Yeah. Um, in choosing these buildings, uh, can you give me a little more insight as to like why uh, the building on South Summer Street, we have uh, several public schools, we have several public buildings in the area up at the uh, Kmart Plaza, we have a fire station right here. Why, why this building, this vacant building instead of say the fire department or why this uh, place on South Summer Street instead of uh, um, the we, we have the uh, DPW headquarters. We have schools right there. Uh, what was sure, I'm, I'm happy to speak to that. So, um, you know, as the radio frequency engineer, my first responsibility when I'm looking into uh, locations to augment our coverage is to produce what we call in my industry a search area, um, where I kind of come up with a concept for uh, in a given area. Um, I feel that this site has um, the proper you know, spacing to provide service in an area that's gonna augment our service um, and um, to work well with the other facilities so that our service in and out of an area is ubiquitous, that uh, to the customer they've always maintained service. Um, I provide that to a real estate consultant who then goes out, um, looks at my um, you know, design goals and um, We'll go in, you know, city records and identify properties um, that seem to be consistent with what I'm looking for. So the basic features I give him uh, or her is a rough square area of where I'm looking for a facility, and you know, building height totals. You know, um, if this was a, a site in the woods, I'd give him an idea of how big I want a tower. But in this case, uh, because there's existing infrastructure. Um, what I, I won't say that I, I'm familiar with every single you know school um, or municipal property in and around these, um, but I will only comment that traditionally Verizon hasn't, for example, um, worked to co-locate our equipment on top of say like elementary schools, just because uh, typically we find that um, parents may have radio frequency safety concerns um, that uh, outweigh you know some of the um, perceived benefits of wireless services. So really that's where it, that's where it started, um, is frankly me putting um, multiple areas out there and a real estate person going to, okay. um, you know, uh, speak, um, you know, to identify potential properties. And I, I think in this circumstance, again, I think as Attorney Fryman mentioned, we, we understand that there, um, you know, uh, may be very legitimate concerns regarding the landlord um on our perspective you know those those aren't conversations that that we really have we really um you know limit our scope and attorney Feynman could comment further based on you know um whether or not you know legally the landlord can enter into a lease agreement with Verizon um and then beyond that um really as you mentioned our focus is on uh the structure and integrity of the buildings or properties that we're looking to affix right. our And we did Ooh. submit so, structural exams, which we yep. do as part of our due right. diligence, which is more focusing on the title and you know the legal aspects of being able to, as you said. Um, who, who was a real estate consultant? Uh, for these three, well, so there's four different sites. Um, his name for the record is David Vivian. He's with a firm called Structure Consulting that uh, Verizon uses to um, go out and negotiate leases. Where, where are they out of? I'm sorry? Where where, where's, the, where, where's Mr. Vivian's firm based? Do you know? Um, Oh. Arling, Arlington, <laughs> Massachusetts. Well, Dave's lo local, though. He lives, he lives, lives in Wilbraham. Wilbraham. Please? Dave Vivian lives in Wilbraham. Yeah. Great. 
I'm just saying he's local. I mean, we're all local, mostly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, um, yeah, I, I'm going to... Um, nice thing is we have a lot of leeway, so that's, that's, that's one good thing about being a city councilor is that we don't, we don't have to have a rigid you know, checklist. So we have some flexibility. So if a councilor wants to make a motion, um, we have a motion. We'll, 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 we'll hear the motion go from there. Now, if somebody makes a motion table, um, <coughs> as, you, as you know, it won't, be, it won't be debatable. So we'll just, you know, we'll just have to take the, we'll have to take the motion. So I'll, I'll recognize Councilor McGivern um, right now. Councilor? Jay, not a, a, a long answer, but you, you mentioned radio frequencies in schools and concerns of parents. Telecommunications Act doesn't allow us to even talk about radio frequencies and, and possible harmful effects on anyone. So why is it different for schools as it is for an elderly tower or mm -hmm. an apartment building? Right, so, so really it's not different. In any type of infrastructure, Verizon has the same rigid requirements for radio frequency safety. Um, but, you know, what we perceive in, um, you know, my personal history as well as the history of my colleagues is that um, college campuses or high schools are areas where generally the, the community um, is open to um, those types of investments in wireless infrastructure. I don't have any personal experience with Verizon um, ever affixing to, let's say, a middle school or an elementary school. Um, you know, I, I think Verizon um, may have done that somewhere in the country, but that's just my own experience. But the requirements for RF safety are the same for any building. I'm not, I'm not questioning your safety or requirements, but the perception in terms of how, how sites are chosen. I, I just on, on, on uh, Chester Street alone, I could give you five sites that are better within one block. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they aren't what Councilor Roman talked about, you know, issues. Mm -hmm. I, Joe, you're in the I wrong business. I don't know any of these. If they're shadowed by other buildings, that, you know, that has Probably. to be well, elevated above the other buildings. Real Street is buildings. shadowed by Our Lady of Guadalupe's church steeple. Mm -hmm. There's a building right across the street from Our Lady of Guadalupe that is taller than, than the church and taller than 302 Chestnut Street. Mm -hmm. The gymnasium building for, for Our Lady of Guadalupe is taller in, 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 I think, a better location than 302 Chestnut Street. The library is within two blocks the other way. There are several buildings in that area that could be done also, and there aren't, quote, landlord issues. Mm -hmm. Understood. Yeah, I mean, again, I have to say honestly, um, the, the councilor's comments regarding the landlord are really uh, the first time I have personally ever heard about this, and that's only just because um, in my particular role, um, you know, I, I really don't get involved in the leasing side, nor does Attorney Fryman, but, you know, we appreciate the comments regardless. No, I, I, I appreciate that. I really do. Uh, I would say... Um, I would say, Joe, you all set? Go ahead, Joe. I'm, no. I'm, well, I'm, no, I'm all go. set, but before no. we, before we make, if there's going to be a motion on the table, it sounds like, um, can we try to resolve when we're going to take care of this? We do have, I mean, those aren't all of the sites. I mean, if we could move forward on Kmart and the other, the other site. Well, that let me, I'll just throw my two cents about Kmart. Now, I, <laughs> now, <laughs> now Mr. Pope, who signed off on this? He represents Bricksmore. Um, you know, he's no doubt he's a gentleman, um, and you know we've never met because you know he's on Lexington Avenue and I'm I'm in Holyoke. But but uh, he, he emails and, and does reply, um, so I I do appreciate that. But you know, Miss Fryman, w next time you drive by Kmart or if you ever shop there, um, you'll you'll look just to the south of Kmart, and you'll see empty storefronts that have been boarded up for going on three plus decades. And now why is that, Ms. Fryman? Well, because they are riddled with asbestos. Now why is it riddled with asbestos? Because the company, Sears Holding Company, won't clean it out. Well, why won't they clean it out? Well, I guess your guess is probably as good as mine. I I'm thinking it's money. Um, so they'd rather just let it sit there, and then they're gonna come to me for a vote to give them cash in a lease. I don't think so. You're not going to get my vote. That, what I represent, that's the word I represent. So that vote's not going to happen. I will not vote to approve this for ever, uh, unless I hear back from Mr. Mr. Pope or Bricksmore about what they're going to do about that property. Um, I, I don't feel any obligation to justify this beyond that. 
um, and, and I don't think there's really anything you can show me the ordinance to force me to make take a vote on this. Uh, to Councilor McGivern's point, this is not a public hearing. So we don't have to continue this to any date. I don't have to take this up again. I'm the chairman of this committee, and so long as I'm appointed chair, which my understanding is I'll probably be chair for at least another two years, um, I may never take this up ever again. So that, therefore, this will just linger in committee for two years. So that's, those are the consequences that your client, or not your clients, your clients are here, but um, the parties with whom your client's company is dealing are facing. So they'll have nothing and like it, <laughs> as they say, if the if if the if the motion carries. So that that's what you're looking at right now. Yeah, I mean, I've <clears> never <throat> been. I've been doing this for over 20 years. I did all the permitting and polio care, but you know, I've never been in a situation where the board, uh, uh, city council, or whatever in front of would tell us who we could lease to and who we couldn't. I just haven't run into that before. So this is a whole new realm to. Have someone dictate no, you, you're, you're, you're taking our words beyond beyond what we said. We're not telling oh. you with whom you can and cannot lease. Well, you're actually no. saying you won't approve certain landlords. So no, no, I'm I'm saying I, I'd like to hear back from them. I think that's what my colleague heard back from. So yeah, don't don't twist my words. Um, we we have situations at hand where we represent certain constituencies, and your clients are asking us to benefit these parties who have not helped out our constituencies so okay. again the conditions are for filing a permit is to right. go and get the right. tax Thank certification you. Uh, Council Roman. Thank you and I would say do your due diligence and just Google an address because that's all you have to do for one or two of these addresses to see an arrest within the last two years I knocked on a door where there was a drug transaction made in front of me while I was campaigning not two three months ago at one of these buildings so due diligence would also be caring about the lives inside specifically when it's a non-business and so my colleagues exactly don't take the words out of my mouth I want to hear from these landlords and what we're saying is that exactly that we Verizon Wireless is providing cash to landlords that don't live in the city who aren't doing their job. So the benefit to the larger good is still not a, bene a true benefit to the entire city of Holyoke. Because any of my colleagues, if we vote this out, I'm going to get 500 phone calls tomorrow saying, how could you give money to a landlord that we're still trying to hold accountable, that we haven't heard from at all? And that's why I'm saying it's not a negative thing against Verizon Wireless or the type of business you're doing. I want to hear back from this landlord before I could proceed forward. And all I'm saying is the type of leasing that you brought before us before, when we approved the... Um, Delaney House one. We heard from that landlord. They were here. They were present. They were saying, this is what we do for the city. This is the benefit that not only is it going to do for the city of Holyoke, but for my business, for the constituents. Here's everything I've done. But I can tell you that three out of the four properties for me, I need to hear from that landlord. And I cannot proceed forward. And I support my colleagues to ask to please table this. I need good concrete answers. And I'm not, you could enter into a lease with whomever you'd like. That's, I'm not saying that at all. I would never prohibit that. But there's two sides to every story. And that's why, thank God, I'm someone who fights against capitalism sometimes to say can't just be cut and dry business check and we're done and we follow the rules because we as a city when this if, if this passes have to go back and think about the human lives that it impacts and it's not just on the Kmart Plaza three out of the four properties that you're bringing to us have human lives living in them that are deteriorating that I've seen with my own eyes my own eyes me sitting here a drug deal so you're telling me that you support me putting a tower on top of a drug dealing building is that what you're telling me tonight I can't support that. I need to hear from that landlord. And that's not anything against the work that you all have done, but please allow me to table this, come back when we've heard from the landlord, and I can get some answers on the conditions of the inside, not just the structural outside. It's, of course, it can support your towers. If that was the case, I would be an automatic go. But there's some real human life issues on the inside that I have to answer to as well. And that's why we as a city do, and counselors, we represent businesses, residents, voters, and non-voters alike. So thank you. Oh, and I make a, oh, sorry. I'd like to also strongly suggest that you find a local real estate consultant and you wouldn't be going through this right here, what you're going through right now. I totally see we, we need the increased coverage. We need the infrastructure improvements here. But you should really do your due diligence and get somebody local that will point you in the right direction so you're not stumbling into these land these landmines there there's there are buildings in the area in every one of these areas right 
that would, would accomplish what you need with the radio frequencies, but would be of a benefit to the community and, and probably a local landlord or, or the community in general, not, not a, a, a slumlord down in Lexington Ave in New York City. Motion to table, Mr. President. I'll second Mr. it. Chairman. Uh, uh, Can I still ask a question? Uh, no, this, this, that's over. Uh, I, I'm, I'd like to hear the question from the attorney. Well, it's this is non-debatable, so um, you want to want to withdraw? Withdraw. Okay, Councilor. Uh, so, uh, I've, one question is: What information are you seeking? Just to clarify. And secondly, when you talk about us looking for properties, what kind of standards are you looking? I mean, we're, we just wouldn't know what would be acceptable and not be acceptable because we wouldn't know that Kmart was an issue. We wouldn't know. I mean, I just. Thank you, Mr. President. Council so a few things, like I just said, I'm going to pull the police record and the call log. I'm going to ask the Board of Health to inspect to ensure that the conditions of the units are good. I'm going to ask the, build, the planning department to go in and inspect the inside interiors of these units. And then I'm going to get those answers back. And that might take time. That's what I'm looking for. Number two is, just like with any other developer uh, in this city, since I've been on here the last two years, um, instead of just the night before, I get a call from these prospective developers as the ward counselor to say, hey, counselor, this is where we're thinking of building and doing. Can you give me insight? Or if the realtor was to show up and say, hey, I'm interested in this block, nine times out of 10, half the developers I never hear from again. But I go out and I walk with them. I introduce them to the neighborhood association president. They point out issues. They talk to the residents. They hear feedback. Um, you know, we had a possible biodiesel plant. I still haven't heard anything back from them, but they've come to town and checked with us. Check with your ward counselors. The best way to start, there's seven ward counselors. Pick up a phone, call them. If you've identified a building through a potential, you know, like my colleague was saying, if it was a local real estate agent, a regional real estate agent, hey, we identified this property. And like I said, three out of the four properties, the same landlord with a DBL out in Florida, we would be able to tell you, hey, there's an issue or concern with that building on the interior or with the or with whatever. We can point out little nuances that only a ward counselor would know um, and then reach out to some of the at-large counselors. They might hear from constituents that I don't hear from that they can say, hey, that's a problem here or that's a problem spot. I mean, this, I'm pointing awesome. to him because he's the mailman, so he's everywhere. So How will we get the information that you're seeking but once you get that information I'll file him. a separate order um, and I'll request that of the landlord so that'll probably be on the next City Council agenda um, that I'll file and request that officially because we all know here at City Hall if you don't well, officially file it doesn't exist well and what I'll say just from the, the Kmart Plaza perspective you can ask Larry uh, again very easy to reach and I have his email if you need it uh, attorney Freiman um, what, what is he gonna do is he ever gonna are they, is that company ever gonna I know but by the way, I, I thought Sears was going out of business. Apparently, you know, Sears and Kmart survive well in Holyoke, so they still have a, they're still they're still earning money. Uh, they're they're not shy about shutting down stores all across America, Kmart's and Sears. But apparently, these are surviving at least through the Christmas season, the holiday season. Um, so I, I would assume that they're still um, making profits. And uh, so my simple question is. Um, uh, Come back with with some feedback. Let us know what it is you plan to do with um, with that empty storefront that's been empty for three decades, uh, boarded up. It's 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 a living eyesore, and um, it's it just unreasonable to <laughs> to think I'm you know to think I'm going to vote otherwise. Um, and then, and by the way, but but I would be reasonable if we come back with some kind of uh, feedback for for, for Council Romans. Um, and furthermore, I'm, I'm, t I'm anticipating paying a vote. We haven't voted yet, so I don't know how this is going to fall, fall, shake out. If, we, if the motion at the table doesn't carry, then we'll, we'll have another vote. Um, but let's just, I'm going to go on the assumption that we're going to table it. By the way, we could vote to deny it, too, and we're not doing that. That's one thing. And second of all, if there is some feedback that you present to our administrative assistant, uh, Mr. Allen, um, um, that provide some kind of a sense that there's going to be a conversation about this or uh, better yet um, some specifics about how these issues are going to be resolved just contact Mr. Allen I will put you back on another agenda um, it'll be after the new year we're not going to meet again until after after the new year but we will we will meet again um, hopefully in January early January and we will um, take it from there so okay motion to the table so, second um, do we have to do a roll call vote? Well, we'll do a roll call vote. Councilor, well, hold on a second. I, well, it's not debatable. So, Councilor McGivern? No. Councilor Sullivan? No. Councilor Bartley, yes. Councilor Roman? Yes. Councilor Tallman? No. Okay, that fails. Three to two. Two to three. You got another motion? <coughs> Make a motion to deny. 
Second. Uh, we'll do another, another discussion. A, a discussion. Yeah, Councilman McGivern. Um, what are the reasons for the denial? They have to meet the Telecommunications Act. Well, my motion for denial on it would be to come back with some uh, more reasonable properties. We can't do that. We can't do that. You want to withdraw? Let's draw. Motion to reconsider tabling. Oh, you can just say motion. Motion table again. I'll, I'll, I'll second it. I was hoping we could have a little more discussion. Not debatable. Joe, what's your vote? No. Councilor Sullivan? Yes. Councilor Bartley, yes. Councilor Roman? Yes. Councilor Tallman? No. Motion carries 3 to 2. Motion is tabled. Um, one more motion will do motion it. Motion to adjourn. Second on the motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you.